I'll admit to you that what I'm going to present to you today, I've never presented before. That gasp that you just heard was Joel. <laughs> That's not the whole truth. I have never presented this material in 45 minutes. I've done it over a four-week course. I've done it in a three-hour workshop. I've done it in a two-hour workshop, but never 45 minutes, so you best listen fast as we go through this. I want to begin by sharing with you a summary of my personal credo, just to give you an idea about where I'm coming from and who this crazy guy is standing up in front of you. But I begin my credo with, there is one presence called by many names and perceived in many forms. I am that presence being Lawrence. I am the creating of the creator. I am the breathing of the breath. I am incarnated here and now to eat, drink, and find pleasure in my toil. This life is a gift. And one of the best quotes I've ever found is by Albert Camus. If there is sin against, if there is sin against life, it consists in hoping for another life and in eluding the implacable grandeur of this life. Isn't that cool? That's one of those things I wish I had said. But it, it, it brings it up pretty qu- clearly. Well, the official title of what I'll be sharing with you was Creating the Life of Your Dreams, How's It Working for You? Now, we all at one time or another have made a decision or set a goal, planned to do something, made a New Year's resolution, and didn't follow through with it. We've all had that experience on some level or another. And when that happens, we start asking questions. You know, why why am I failing? Why can't I follow through on this? This is important. This is good for me. Why can't I make it happen? And we sometimes ask, you know, what am I doing that I shouldn't be doing? Well, there are workshops out there to tell you about that. Or you ask, what am I not doing that I should be doing? There are workshops out there about that, that you can take a look at that. But we start looking at ourselves, and a couple of the things that come up. One is that we start thinking, well, I'm really good at making bad decisions. And I'm not very good at making good decisions. And we kind of get down on ourselves a little bit. And then we think, well, I'm I'm just a failure. I'm weak. That's one I hear a lot when I'm working with people. I'm I'm just weak in that way. And I want to, this is a little bit of an aside, but I want to say to you that you are not weak. And you cannot fail. Now that's Lawrence speaking there. You cannot fail. I personally believe that that God, Spirit, the Creator, the Divine, whatever name you use for that uh, source of all being, is still evolving in being. That God is not finished. And if I am God being Lawrence, then everything that Lawrence does, sees, feels, tastes, accomplishes, not accomplishes, whatever else, everything that I do contributes to the evolvement of source. Just not finished yet, because I'm not finished yet. You see, God sees a sunset through my eyes absolutely uniquely, just like through yours. So every time I look at a sunset and go, ah, like this, that experience registers within the being of the Creator. And the being of the Creator is enhanced because of that. So everything I do, everything, did you get that? Everything I do, that reminds me of a story. Have you seen those advertisements of the elephant with pistachios? Oh, it's hilarious. It absolutely, if you, I, you can probably Google it. Ele- elephant and pistachios. There's one of them, this elephant's lying on the floor on his back like this with pistachio shells all over the place. And he says, the squirrel sisters came by last night. And they are so wild and they will do anything for pistachios. I mean, anything. I'm not sure why that came to mind. But you can't do anything and fail. Because nothing is a failure because everything you do, everything you do is registered in the being of the creative source. And it contributes to the evolving of that source. I believe that with all my heart. And it changed the way I look at the world when when I began to look at things like that. So when you set a goal and don't reach it, when you make a New Year's resolution and you procrastinate, when you fail to do whatever it is that you're planning to do, and you begin to think of yourself as a failure, I would encourage you to put that word, you've heard it already, put that word out of your vocabulary. Don't talk about being a failure because you can't fail. 
everything you do, even if you don't reach the goal you've set, you've still set the goal and not reached it. And that in itself is an experience which registers in the being of God and enhances and evolves the being of God. Now, I'm not saying throw up your hands and say, oh, it doesn't matter whether I do anything at all or not. If I just, you know, slip through life, that's okay too. Because even that experience, being a bum, being broke, being sick, all of those things are experiences that are registering within the being of God, and it's not a failure. Now, I choose not to be those things, because I really don't like that kind of experience at all. There are better experiences to be had. But in the process, when something happens that you or someone else would consider failure, let it go. It's not a failure. So you cannot fail. That helps you a whole lot when you're asking those questions about why am I not fulfilling my promises? Why am I not going through with my New Year's resolutions? Those questions come up for you. And knowing that you can't fail is really important. Now, so you're not weak in character at all. Now, what, I, what we perceive and often label as failure is actually the working out of a dynamic that I call primary decisions. Now, I want to share with you a little vignette of something else I teach. I've recently started calling it the, the Palmer Paradigm because nobody, I never heard anybody else say it, so I claimed it, put my name on it. That is, when I'm investigating, when I'm researching, when I'm trying to learn something new, I ask three questions. What is it? What is it? So what? Now what? What is it? Define it. Figure out what you're looking at. Then say, so what? Why am I taking time to do this? What's the importance of it? What's the significance of it? And then now what? What do I do about it? And we're going to use that paradigm as we, as we look at this idea of, of not following through on things. So I call this a primary decision because it is so important. Now, what is a primary decision? You've heard a lot of people have been credited with the, with the statement that a human being is a tool-making animal. A lot of people claim credit, and the evidence seems to be that Benjamin Franklin is the one who actually said it first of all, so thank you, Ben, that a human being is a tool-making animal. And an anthropologist would agree with that, that we are tool-making animals. A sociologist would say that we are community-making animals. A psychologist would say that we are idea-making animals. And probably a philosopher would say that we are meaning-making animals. So it is this process of making meaning of our world that comes, that eventually flows into this process of making a primary decision and having those be a part of our life. So we are meaning-making. One of the things that we try to do is make sense of our world. How many of you like fairy tales? Well, now, or as a kid, you know. You can still like them now as you're an adult. I love fairy tales. I had three books about that thick of fairy tales. I'd love to read when I was a kid. And what are fairy tales all about? They're trying to make some kind of sense of this world that we live in. They're trying to find meaning. And that's important. Humor is about trying to find meaning. Deep, serious stuff is about trying to find meaning. When I went to seminary, I went to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And the theology building was sinking on one end. And we always joked about the professors that were down on that end of the building. There was so much heavy theology, it was sinking the building into the ground. So we can, we can get input from that realm as well when we start talking about primary decisions. Now, as you are a child, even though you may not have the sophistication of language down pat yet, you are in the process of looking for meaning and assigning meaning to the things that are around you. Uh, Bev and I have a, a two-year-old granddaughter who's just a few minutes from where we live, so we get to spend a lot of time with her, watching her develop. And we got a, a little one, too, just born, so he's going to follow along there. But at Easter, we had her over, and we're dying Easter eggs. And, of course, you know, her attention span's about that of a gnat, you know. But we, we were having fun anyway. And we pulled the yellow one up out of the dye, and she looked at it, and she said, Oh, wow! And that was the first time we'd heard her 
express something just exactly like that. You know what she was doing? She was making meaning. Here's an event, here's an experience that she just observed and she gave it a meaning which was, wow, which thrilled us to death. Yeah. She's, that will always be with her. That's registered in her brain, her body somewhere. So even when we're very small, we begin making meaning, figuring out what this world is all about. Now, an interesting thing, a fascinating thing that, that the researchers have discovered is that some of these experiences of making, creating, and assigning meaning happen pre-verbally. Even before a baby begins to even blabber very much at all, we're in the process energetically of making meaning of our world. You've all heard that idea about, about babies that don't thrive. Babies will not thrive if they're not touched. Well, a baby who do, is not touched and misses that assigns some kind of meaning to that. And a baby who's touched and talked to and and cared for and given stimulus and all kinds of things like that, they also assign meaning to their experience, even pre-verbally. And then as they get a little bit older and begin to identify with their own feelings, our granddaughter restarts saying, my toys. (laughs) She's getting used to boundaries here. So she's growing. And as we grow, we begin to make meaning on a more sophisticated level. We can start comparing things and saying, this is more important than this. I like this. I don't like this. I want this. I don't want that. I'm close to this. I'm afraid of that. That begins to happen to us. And as we go about making meaning, another thing that follows that is making primary decisions. Now, a primary decision is something that you decide, something that you choose that's on a very deep level. And it has to do in a big way with what's going on in your world. When you experience the world, again, you you give it meaning, and from that meaning comes the primary decision, such as a child who is neglected will give the meaning that I'm not important, I don't matter, and this world is certainly not a pleasant place. It's not a good place to be. That happens even pre-verbally, but it's there energetically nevertheless. We begin to to see other things. We see that we're loved, and we start start to think, well, I must be pretty special. Oh, that reminds me of a story. Um, You know, the the difference in dogs and cats, and dog lovers and cat lovers. What happens is if you call a dog, the dog will come to see what you want. All right? You call a cat, and he'll take a message and get back to you later. (laughs) But we have experiences where we're loved, And we say, I am adored, I am appreciated, I'm valuable, and the world is a pretty safe place. Now, what happens is that not only are those primary decisions made, but we hold on to them. There's this mechanism within the human being that when we learn things, it sticks with us, especially the things that we learn when we're young. How many of you... Well, some of you are old enough to know when we didn't use seatbelts very much. Remember back those days? And remember when the kids were allowed to sit in the front seat? You know, we don't have to strap them in this armor-clad thing in the back seat. Well, I shouldn't say that because that's a good thing. A lot of kids have been saved because of that. But anyway, I grew up during the time when the kid's standing up on the front seat beside you. And you stop quickly, what do you do? You put the arm out. Okay, you know about that. I see, yeah. My baby boy is now 46 years old. And you know what happened the other day when I was driving down US-1? A Florida driver stomped on his brakes. You know what I did? (laughs) My baby's that old and in Chicago, and I'm still doing this. Why? Because I made a decision to take care of him, protect him, and it's still there. These things are incredibly resilient. So be careful of the decisions that you make. Now, the insidious part of of this whole scenario is that it doesn't matter whether it's good or bad. Wouldn't it be nice if all the good things we learned were tenacious and all the bad things were just kind of mushy and disappeared, right? No. The good things that we learn hang around because every day we can wake up and we don't have to learn them all over again and we can go on and experience the goodness of life. Well, the bad things that we learn are the same way. The bad habits, the bad decisions you make, they're just as tenacious as the good. And we wonder why we have so much trouble changing our life. 
These primary decisions are made at a very, very deep level. And they're tenacious. They hang in there with us, both good and bad. I don't usually use notes, but I am today because I need to stay on track on time. Um, Okay. Some of the things that we say to ourselves that turn into primary decisions. Something like, um, I will never be hungry again. I will never be poor again. I will never be afraid again. I will never be vulnerable again. Any of you ever said those things? Are they going on in the back of your mind? How about F you? Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Every day. (laughs) Yeah. But for some people, that is a primary decision that's at the very basic, the foundation of their life. What about, you're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do. Oh, yeah, I'll show you. There's a wonderful story about a little boy. And his mother said, sit down. He said, no. She said, sit down. No. She said, sit down. He said, no. And she went over and shoved him down in the chair. And he looked up at her and said, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. (laughs) How many of you are still standing up on the inside when you go out in the world? How many deal with your boss and say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and you're still sitting, standing up on the outside? Those are how the primary decisions work. These primary decisions determine how your life goes. Because when it all comes down to it, those deep, basic, foundational beliefs and decisions are what determine how you react in the world and how you perceive the world. How you're going to be in the world or if you're going to withdraw from the world. You've either known people or heard of people who had such a negative experience growing up and created such uh, painful primary decisions. They withdraw from the world. They refuse to go out. They refuse to interact with people. They refuse to be in a community. And that's not the way we were designed to be. We were designed to be active and healthy and whole and positive and excited about being alive. Charles Fillmore, who along with his wife Myrtle founded the Unity Movement, said when he was in his 90s, he said, I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm and spring forth with a mighty faith to do the things that ought to be done by me. I love that quote, 90 years old. That became for him a primary decision. My credo that I read for you a moment ago is a primary decision for me because when it comes down to looking at what's most basic, that's where I go. That's what I find when I am there. So these ideas of, of, of primary decisions are very powerful and they're important to us. Now, that's a bit about what is a primary decision. The second question was, so what? Why do we even talk about this? Why are we concerned about this at all? And it says, I said before, because it is so important. Well, let's, let's mention just three areas. I mean, you could do dozens of areas in your life where this thing plays out, where it's a part of it. But three particular areas. One is how you see the world, this place that we live, this place that you interact with. How do you see that? You, at some point, made a primary decision about how you view the world. At some point, you may have come to believe, as I mentioned earlier, the world's not a safe place and the world's out to get me. That can develop into a full-blown mental illness. But you decided at some point how you were going to perceive the world and what you were going to believe about it. And fortunately for many of us, we came to believe the world's an okay place at least. If not great, at least it's okay. I don't worry about somebody's, you know, after out to get me. I don't have to worry about the world deliberately hurting me. I don't have to be afraid when I go out. But, you know, it's just kind of, eh. It took me a while to get comfortable with being here in this body, in this place. I used to feel like I got off at the wrong cosmic bus stop because this world just felt foreign to me. I don't feel that way anymore. I still have some of those thoughts around that, but I don't feel that way anymore. And that was a a change of a primary decision for me. Some of you have also had wonderful family lives, a wonderful community life, and you look at the world and say, yeah, I can't wait to get out there again tomorrow. It's going to be a great day. Here we go. That works too. But we, we make primary decisions about the world in which we live. 
that determine how you're going to function in that world. We make primary decisions about our self-image. Now, unfortunately, not all parents are good parents. Let's just admit that and recognize that right up front. All families are not healthy families. You know, I've done a, a, my focus in graduate school was pastoral care and counseling. And one of the things I found out very early in being in church is that holidays are tough times for people. Why is that, I wonder? You know, you, you get uh, one of the things going on, you get candy at most of the holidays. You get gifts in most of the days. It's supposed to be a happy time. But what's the one consistent factor around holidays that causes people trouble? Family. I got to go back home. My parents are coming for a week at Christmas. You know, on and on it goes. We make primary decisions about ourselves based mostly on what other people say and do. As it should be, because ideally, I had an office manager one time, he used to always say, in a perfect world, you know, this is the way it would be. Well, in a perfect world, we would all have perfect, loving parents and a healthy, functioning family. And that's what we would learn about ourselves from. And we would make a primary decision that I am wonderful and I am loved and I can do anything that I want to do. That's that's a great thing to be given because, again, those beliefs, those deep, core, foundational, basic ideas are tenacious. They hang in there with you because you get out in the world, you you will get some challenges to that. And as I said earlier, any kind of negative belief you have about yourself is just as tenacious. And you form primary decisions in a negative way as well. Nobody's ever going to love me. And unfortunately, just it, I have literally sat there and cried in my office in a, in a counseling session when somebody tells me some of the things that people have said to them. To have a parent say, you're not worth anything at all. One, one lady said, her father said to her, you're not worth the spit on the sidewalk. How do you do that to another human being, much less your own child? But that happens. And those things become primary decisions that operate deep, deep underneath everything else, but exert a constant influence on our life, on our choices, on our behaviors. The good ones are there too. They also uh, add that influence, but it's always there, always there. So we make primary decisions about our self-image based on what the world tells us and what's going on around us. Now, fortunately, you folks are on a spiritual journey. You're here. You're learning. You're growing. You're challenging those things, and that's good. Uh, It's great that we can, can heal, that we can come to that place of changing our mind. But wouldn't it be wonderful, too, if we didn't have to do all that hard work? Well, maybe, maybe some of you gluttons for punishment. That's all right. You can do that, too. So our primary decisions are made about the world that we live in and determine how we interact. The primary decisions are made about our self-image. How do we see ourselves? What do we believe about ourselves? And that hangs in there with us. And we also learn about relationships. We have primary decisions that we make about relationships. And we play those out. No, No hands this time, invisible hands as I used to say, but how many of you have been in the same relationship over and over and over? How many of you made the same choice with the same kind of person more than once? Why does that happen? Because you made at some point a primary decision about what a relationship is like. And maybe this time it's going to be different. Maybe this time it's going to be better. Is it? No. Because you've set that pattern and you keep repeating it over and over. I've heard of, I've worked with people who would get in a relationship and then break up before the other person can break up with them. You know, I know you're going to hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you first before you can hurt me. Over and over again. Why? Because these primary decisions are so tenacious and they're so ingrained in who and what we are at such a deep, basic level. Remember, many of these decisions were formed pre verbally. And that kind of energy you can't access with your smart mind. Just because you have a degree in psychology or whatever else, those decisions are coded in energy in you. And just simply, great ideas won't get to them. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So, 
What is a uh, primary decision? So what? Why are we concerned about it? Oh, I know one example I was going to share with you is that of a computer. Now, you don't have to be a computer geek to, to understand this illustration. I know very often when I'm speaking, I mention computers and several people roll their eyes like, you know, I don't even know how to turn the thing on. I, I, <laughs> Remind me of a story. Uh, there was a guy called the tech line for help for a computer company and said, you know, I, um, I broke my cup holder off on my computer. You know, the little disc that comes out where you put the CD in it. He broke his cup holder off. And the guy on the phone, the, help, the guy who was supposed to be helping, said, do you still have the original box your computer came in? He said, yeah. I said, well, pack it all up real neatly, take it back to the store you got it, and tell them you're too stupid to have a computer. <laughs> but when you turn your computer on, there is a default in operation. The, the factory set it. There's a certain font that comes up. There's a certain font size that comes up. There's a certain spacing that comes up. It's default. It's there. And every time you turn your computer on, there it is. And that's good because you don't have to wonder what's going to happen. It's there. Well, what if you want a different font? Well, you can go up and pull the menu down, change the font. You want a different size, change the size, spacing, all of that. Type your letter. It's just like you want it. Great. Turn your computer off. Come back tomorrow. Guess what? It's back to the default. It went back to what it was before, what had already been programmed in it. Now, even people who have failed from time to time to accomplish what they want to accomplish, even people who have not kept all of their New Year's resolutions at some time or another have done something successfully. You've made a decision and stuck to it and you're really proud of yourself. Sure, that happens. But what happens when it gets tough, when times get hard, when you're faced with a challenge? What happens is you revert back to the default that you've created and built up by the primary decisions because they're always there. And if you get challenged, if you get tired, that, you know, what's the thing? Um, halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. When you start getting like that and your reserves are down, guess what comes up? All those decisions all those primary decisions that you make, good or bad, healthy or unhealthy, they come up. So what happens when you have made a decision, you're gonna, you have a New Year's resolution, you're going to quit smoking. That's something I've never dealt with, so I'll use that example. You're going to quit smoking, and it doesn't work, and you start beating yourself up. What comes up for you? What comes up? Everybody wants me to quit smoking. I'll be damned if I'll quit smoking. You're not going to tell me what to do. Now, you may not say those words. You may not even hear those words. You may not even cognitively be aware of those words, but energetically they are imprinted in that primary decision, and it's there. And that's why it happens. And the harder you push, the harder it pushes back. If you take a rubber band and just hold it in your hand, it's just kind of loose and floppy, right? Nothing going on there. And you start pulling it, though. What happens to the rubber band the further you pull it? It gets tighter and tighter and tighter. There's more resistance. And when you start resisting these primary decisions that you've made along the way, the more you resist, the more you get resisted. The harder you work, the more you swear, this time I'm going to make it work. That primary decision is saying, oh, yeah, watch this. So it's not for the lack of trying hard. It's a dynamic that we are connected with here. Now, there was another story there somewhere. I have to watch my stories. It scares my wife when I say those words. I remember a story. Well, I'll give it to you later. So... We talked about what is a primary decision. It's that decision you make on a very deep foundational level about something that's really important for you. So what? These primary decisions determine how your life goes. The challenging part is they're so often unconscious or subconscious, and they come from a preverbal background. They're there for us. They're there in us. So that, that's the so what. Now what? 
given that little bit of information that you know, and I know I haven't given you a whole lot because of the time factor, but given what you know, now what? What do we do about this? The recognition, the awareness that this dynamic is in operation is really important, and it's an important starting place for us to realize, hey, I know something now. I can do something about this. That makes a big difference. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a vignette of another program that I do that, again, is another four-week course. But I call it Credo Cupido Sio. Those are Latin words. Credo means I believe. Any of you ever done a credo paper or a credo project in school or anywhere? Hmm. Okay, credo is a Latin word that means I believe. And the credo process is about looking at what you believe and what you say you believe. Cupido is a Latin word which means I want or I desire. That comes along and you look at what you say you desire and what you really desire. And sio is the Latin word which, which is connected with, with science. I know. I had a fifth grade or sixth grade science teacher named Elsie Woodward. She was about this tall, and she was just a spitfire, and she loved to find excuses. Back then, teachers paddled students. She had a reputation for swinging a mean paddle, I'm telling you, and she looked for opportunities to do that. But anyway, she said in her class, if you don't remember anything else in this class, you remember that science comes from a Latin word which means to know. And thank you, Ms. Woodward. I still remember it. I honor her in that. So cupido, I believe. Credo, I believe. Cupido, I want. Sio, I know. Now, if we begin to look at those things we realize that we sometimes say one thing and really believe something else. So we sometimes want something, but we really want something else. And sometimes we say we know things and we really don't know at all. So this is another step in being able to change these primary decisions. I didn't want to give you the idea by talking about how tenacious they are and how basic and fundamental they are that they're out of reach and being pre-verbal and subconscious and all that. They're not out of reach once you become aware of that dynamic. And then you begin to ask yourself the questions about, I say I believe this, but do I really believe it? You know, how many people in traditional Christianity, and I grew up in traditional Christianity in, in the Baptist church, and I am so very incredibly grateful for that experience. I had a wonderful experience in the Baptist church. But I've discovered through, the, through my own transition is that there are many people in traditional Christianity who say they believe in hell, but they really don't. There are some people who say they believe in salvation, but they really don't. You know, one, one of the most heartbreaking experiences I had as a, as a minister there was an old gentleman in one of my churches who was the salt of the earth, as they say, give you the shirt off his back, do anything for anybody. And I was with him as he was dying. And he was terrified that he had committed the unpardonable sin and didn't know it. And he was going to go to hell when he died. It just broke my heart that this man who had lived his life loving people and was dearly loved by everybody around him could die with that kind of feeling because all through his life he said he believed in salvation and forgiveness and all that but he really didn't and what do you think really was the most the biggest part of his life it's that which he didn't believe same thing with wanting how many of you have said I want that job I want to be you know what that job represents I want to be this corporate giant whatever But in your mind, you're saying, that's not what really I want to be. I want to be a gardener. And when we we create those situations where we say one thing and we really feel and believe something else, we create a dissonance within us. In in New Thought, there's a term called, in old time New Thought, there's a term called chemicalization. That's where a new idea meets the old ideas within us and the battle starts. You know, when, when people get introduced to new thought and all these woo-woo, weird, wonderful ideas, it challenges what's already there and it creates this stir within us. Well, anytime we say, I believe this and I really don't, you're creating that tension within yourself. Anytime you say, I want this, but I really don't, you're creating that cognitive dissonance, that unrest that's inside of you. And that's one of the clues 
that you've got a primary decision operating that's not, as the, not the best for you. So the first beginning is to recognize there is this dynamic going on inside of me called a primary decision. And it determines how I see the world and how I interact with the world. And if it's not working right, if it's not doing what I want for it to do, I can change it. I can make a difference there. Now, in New Thought, there's in Unity New Thought at least, there's another um, paradigm that we teach called the creative process. It's mind, idea, expression. From the one mind that is formless, there comes an idea which is a form, and then it's manifested out into 3D reality. And we use that, we, we teach that to create, to manifest out in the world. Well, a few years ago, I got to thinking, and, and most of the ideas that I have come from working with people and seeing what people are dealing with. And somebody said to me, basically said, you know, you taught me how to create, but you haven't taught me how to uncreate. Because 20 years ago, I created this idea, I created this situation using the creative process, and it was great, but I don't need it anymore. And it's in the way, and I want to get rid of it. I don't know how to get rid of it. I created it, but I don't know how to uncreate it. You know, we're, we're amazing like that. We can create poison that we can't make unpoisonous. We can create radiation and can't create unradiation. But we can change what we have created through the creative process. I call it creative process 2.0. And that is, we turn it upside down. We look at the experience that we're having. We're looking at this primary decision that's no longer serving us, that's in our way, a belief that we're not worthy, that we're not cared that, a belief that the world's not a safe place, a belief that all relationships end in tragedy. We want to change those things. So we begin to look at it as this is the manifestation. You remember the creative process? Mind, idea, expression. When we flip it over, we start with the expression. Here's this expression, this primary decision that is not serving me. Let me back up and look at the idea behind it. Let's look at the energy that is behind it. And you folks are into energy. You, know, you, go out, you go out in the world and say energy and people's eyes glaze over. They don't know what's talking about, what you're talking about. But you know better. So we, we go to the energetic level of an idea. Now this is, and this has already been hinted on a little bit earlier. We look at this primary decision and we appreciate it. We thank it. We bless it because at some point it served you. Everything that you believe served you for some time. Everything that's irritating you now and in your way and aggravating you and keeping you from fulfilling whatever you want to fulfill, everything there served a purpose at some time and it served you at some time, even though it doesn't now. So it's important that you look at that energy, that idea, and say, thank you. It worked great, but... but I don't need this anymore. I need something else. And then move that idea back to mind. Remember, mind, idea, expression. Turn it over. Expression, idea, mind. And you take that idea and you dissolve it back into pure energy and let it go into the universe. And then you can say, it's time for a new primary decision. And you do it the same way as you did originally, except that you have a little more understanding to go along with it now. You have a little more wisdom to go along with it now. And when you start creating a primary decision which is going to be built into you, you say, I want this for my very best. And you realize at some point you may need to even change this one. But you know that you can because you've already done that. So we find ourselves in this situation where it's not hopeless and we're not failures by nature or by character, but we live in a dynamic world that we can influence, a dynamic world that we can change, and that we are dynamic beings that are constantly in the state of being remolded and reshaped. And there are other ways to do it. My way is not the only way. It's the best way, but it's not the only way. Um, <laughs> but I invite you just to take these ideas and chew on them a little bit and see how that works, how it fits. Because I always love to hear something that I hadn't thought about before, and all of a sudden this idea comes up and this idea comes up, and then there's this cascade of ideas that take me in a new direction. And I hope that, it'll, that this will happen for you regarding primary decisions. Let's see if there's one more thing that was there. That reminds me of a story. I told this one in church Sunday, so 
though you, most of you folks didn't hear it. There was a minister who had a reputation for reading his sermons. And two little boys one day thought it would be really funny to go up and sneak one of his, the sheets of his, his sermon out and hide it. So the minister was preaching away, and he was preaching about Adam and Eve that day. And he got down at the bottom of the page and he said, Now Adam said to Eve, and he realized something was wrong here. This is not playing out. So in order to buy himself some time, he said, And Adam said to Eve, and was looking through his sheets, and Adam said to Eve, and he looked up with a distressed look on his face and said, Oh my, there seems to be a leaf missing. (laughs) So I shy away from notes when I can. But I wanted to end with... with, um, one of my favorite poems that I happen to write that um, kind of sums up how I feel about the world, how I feel about myself, how I feel about others. When eternity had inhaled that first beginning gasp and newness sang with virginal voice, there I was loving you. Even when eternity has exhaled that last ending breath and all of creation pauses in completed stillness, There I am, loving you. Round and over, over and round, millions of times of spinning, endings begot in beginning, beginnings offsprung from the end, there I will always be, loving you. Bless you.